us and okay. um a minute. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introductions, and um, it's great to see so many of you here this morning. Um, as I said before, I'm Jessica Martini Lamb and Environmental Resources Manager at Cinema Water. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully, this works. Do you see just a single slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Then it worked the way it should have. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to give uh, sort of two short presentations. The first is just some background about what the uh, Russian River Estuary Project Management Project is, and then um, I'll do a second present uh, and a little bit about the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and then I'll do a, a short second presentation about uh, the Pinniped Monitoring Plan. And Hollis um, or Andy, if there's someone that raises a question in the chat, could you monitor for me? Um, oh, there's a comment from Michael there. Okay. But if someone has a question, um, I can't see everybody. So uh, just I'll, bear with me. I'll monitor the chat for you, Jessica. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, a little background about the Russian River Estuary. So the, the Russian River Estuary is basically where the Russian River uh, meets the Pacific Ocean. And it creates a pretty unique environment in that um, you, it's a sort of co-mingling of fresh water with ocean water. And so when the river mouth is open, um, the tidal exchange that uh, occurs multiple times per day actually sends all the way up towards Austin Creek, which is about uh, 11 river kilometers upstream of the river mouth or about seven miles. And periodically um, a barrier beach will form at the river mouth. And it forms when um, ocean swells are big enough to carry transport sediment that's offshore and um, into on, or onto the beach and basically closes the river mouth inlet and forms that barrier beach. And when the barrier beach forms, the estuary then sort of transitions to a lagoon condition where um, that tidal exchange is, is basically cut off and um, water will rise behind the, the barrier beach and increasing uh, both the depth of the estuary, but also will back water from Austin Creek, sometimes all the way up to Vacation Beach. And when that barrier beach forms and water levels rise, it potentially um, uh, poses a flood risk to low-lying properties along uh, Jenner and the lower parts of the Russian River. And so um, when that happens, uh, Sonoma Water will uh, monitor conditions and uh, based on a number of factors decide if we have to take a beach management action to minimize the flood risk. Um, at the same time, we're also trying to enhance habitat for juvenile steelhead in particular that rely on the estuary for rearing conditions. And so these are really small juvenile fish that will enter the estuary in sort of a freshwater tolerant state. And then they spend their summer months um, into fall as juveniles growing in the estuary um, and evolving a, to a more marine to, uh, salinity tolerant um, life stage. So um, in those summer months, we are trying to really meet two dual objectives when the estuary closes. We're trying to minimize the flood risk that could occur to uh, properties and, and infrastructure along the estuary, but also enhance habitat for those juveniles. And so the, the river mouth can close at any time of the year. Um, we see it most often happen in the spring months and then again in the fall and winter months when we start seeing um, the sort of stronger ocean swells that can really move that sediment into um, the, the river mouth inlet. And um, when that, that closure happens and if we have to do a beach management activity, um, those activities occur at Goat Rock State Beach, kind of north of the concrete cap that, that's referred to as Jetty Groin. Um, 
And from mid-May to mid-October, we call that the lagoon management season. That's the time that overlaps with the juvenile steelhead that uh, rearing season in the estuary. Um, if we have to take a management action, uh, we would try to implement an outlet channel, which basically is designed to try to create a condition that allows for more freshwater um, water uh, depth in the estuary um, that is important for juvenile steelhead habitat, but at the same time allow for some discharge of um, the river across the sandbar. And then outside the lagoon management season, we may conduct what's called an artificial breach. Um, and in that case, we would take a piece of equipment that's staged at the Lower Goat Rock State Beach parking lot and bring it out along the beach and create what we call a pilot channel north of the jetty groin. And a pilot channel basically is a small excavated channel. It's usually the, the shortest distance across the beach um, and uh, near where the inlet last was before it closed. And uh, basically it's, it's created to be big enough to allow water to flow from the lagoon side and scour back open the beach um, and uh, uh, reopen the, the um, river mouth. Um, and, a, and as I said, you know, these activities um, will occur you know, following a natural closure. And those most often happen in the spring and then in the fall and um, in winter months. So associated with our um, estuary management project is a lot of biological and physical monitoring in the estuary. So um, if you're out in the summer months, you may see our biologists out um, in the estuary conducting fishery sampling. We do beach sailing. Um, we also do a lot of downstream migrant trapping um, in some of the lower river tributaries and monitor their fish uh, uh, steelhead movements into the estuary um, as juveniles. And then um, we've com recently completed all of our invertebrate studies, but for since about 2009, we were doing um, a pretty extensive invertebrate study in the estuary, uh, really targeted to understanding what invertebrate species utilize the estuary, um, their geographic distribution within the estuary, but then also looking at what juvenile steelhead are actually eating in the estuary and what their target prey um, are. So um, that was a pretty big, extensive effort. Um, we conduct our, our pinniped monitoring, which is you know, what we'll talk quite a bit about this morning. We also do water quality monitoring. Um, so we're monitoring both um, using sort of what we call vertical profiles. So they're basically these data sons that collect um, water quality information from the surface down to the, the bed of the estuary. And we're looking at water temperatures, dissolved oxygen, salinity, conductivity. Um, and then we also do uh, weekly grab sampling during the summer months where we're looking at things like bacteria, um, pathogens um, in parts of the estuary as well. And then we've done quite a bit of physical processes um, studies where um, we continue to do um, monthly beach topographic surveys where we're monitoring how the beach um, width and height evolves over the, over the um, year. And then um, we've also done quite a bit of work with um, some of our colleagues at Bodega Marine Lab, um, some of our consultants looking at things like circulation and how um, circulation patterns um, and the estuary are affected by things like wind, wave conditions, tides, river inflows, things like that. Um, so all of these activities I've talked about, the beach management activities, all of our biological and physical monitoring um, studies, they're all done in the vicinity of either the Jenner haul out or in the vicinity of harbor seals that might be, or, or sea lions that might be swimming around inside the estuary or the lagoon. And so um, one thing we, we need to consider is um, the federal law, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And this act prohibits the taking of marine mammals unless it's otherwise exempted or authorized under a permit. 
And the Marine Mammal Protection Act authorizes what's called incidental taking that occurs during other law, otherwise lawful activities. And so the Marine Mammal Protection Act has specific definitions for take and harassment. Um, and so take is considered to harass, hunt, capture, or kill, or attempt to do any of those things uh, to a marine mammal. And then harassment is an act of pursuit, torment, or annoyance, uh, which has the potential to injure or disturb by causing sort of disruption of the marine mammal's uh, behavior, behavioral patterns. And uh, the level B uh, harassment is the subject of um, our activities in the estuary, um, which have the potential to disrupt uh, marine mammal behavior uh, patterns. And so the Marine Mammal Protection Act has permits um, that uh, describe what are the permissible methods of take. Um, they require mitigation measures so that we, um, they can ensure that whatever uh, the program or project is doing has a, the least adverse impact on, species, on the marine mammal species and their habitat. And they also include monitoring and reporting requirements. And so in the case of the estuary management project that Sonoma Water implements, we have what's called a letter of authorization, which is a multi-year permit for level B harassment of harbor seals, California sea lions, and elephant seals that might occur while we're doing any of our estuary management activities. And that includes both the beach management activities and all of the biological and water quality monitoring that we do in the estuary. And the permit includes uh, minimization measures, our monitoring activities, and then reporting requirements. And we'll talk about some of those here. So as I mentioned, you know, activities that are included include all the beach management actions, whether they're artificial breaching or outlet channel implementation, and then all of our monitoring studies that we do. So if we're having uh, staff who in our survey group go out or a biologist go out on the beach and collect data um, on the outlet channel measurements themselves, or we're doing our monthly beach topographic surveys, those activities are all described and covered in the um, Marine Mammal Protection Act permit, and then all the biological and water quality monitoring. So if our biologists are in a boat going to a site to do a beach uh, seining survey for fish, um, that activity, uh, is also included in our uh, permit activities because we might drive past a harbor seal in the, in the estuary and that, that could be considered a harassment action um, during the course of our work. So before I move on to the pinniped monitoring, I'm wondering if there are any questions about the estuary management program or Marine Mammal Protection Act in particular. There's nothing in the chat, Jessica. Okay, thanks, Hollis. So um, this next portion of the presentation is gonna talk a little bit about our pinniped monitoring plan. Um, and so the estuary management project has a, a pinniped monitoring plan that was prepared by Sonoma Water and stewards of the coast and redwoods. Um, the monitoring plan basically focuses on population dynamics of the local Jenner haul out and it describes all of our monitoring methods um, that are, are um, applied to our monitoring program. So both uh, baseline and monitoring of any um, activities that have potential to impact the seals and sea lions. And um, our monitoring efforts, our methods are really based on a lot of previous monitoring that has gone on at the Jenner haul out. Um, for those of you that might be new to monitoring the Jenner haul out, it has been extensively monitored for a very long time, and um, good, you know, due to the good work of a lot of um, local folks, uh, starting with the Seal Watch program um, that I think some of you are involved in, and then uh, Dr. Joe Mortensen and Eleanor Tui had um, conducted uh, a lot of monitoring for many, many years. In Eleanor's case, she was taking photographs of the harbor seal and the river mouth daily for many, many, many years. Um, so we have a pretty extensive data set from their efforts. Um, and Sonoma Water did um, quite a bit of monitoring associated with our beach management actions in the late 90s. Um, 
and that effort was also led by, um, by Dr. Mortensen at that time. Um, so the goals and objectives of the monitoring plan are to monitor the response of the pinnipeds um, at, the, at the general haul out to any estuary management activities. We also want to monitor the trends in the population size of the haul out and pup production. And then um, we report the results of the annual monitoring to resource agencies in the public. Our monitoring schedule is um, sort of split up by, by season and activity. Our baseline monitoring uh, is scheduled to occur between March 15th and October 15th of every, um, of every year. And then um, monitoring associated with beach management actions that are um, related to any outlet channel implementation would also occur between May 15th and October 15th. And then um, we'd be monitoring any artificial breaching activities that occur between mid-October and mid-May of each year. Uh, the baseline monitoring methods. So all of our, our uh, baseline monitoring occurs at um, the Highway 1 overlook, um, overlooking Goat Rock State Beach and Jenner. Uh, baseline monitoring is conducted twice a month between March 15th and October 15th. Um, and each survey is about four hours long. Um, the exception is during the pupping season. So during the pupping season, which is generally uh, mostly April, May uh, peak timeframe, um, we're doing weekly monitoring during the pupping season of the haul out. And um, baseline monitoring captures both seal counts and monitors disturbances to the harbor seal haul out. And then for specific beach management actions, um, activities that might occur, whether it's an outlet channel activity or an artificial breaching activity, we have specific monitoring around those events. So uh, there's a pre-survey that happens uh, within one to three days prior to any beach management activities. And then on the day of a beach management activity, we have a, a monitor on site monitoring that activity and then we do a post activity monitoring the next day. And the methods used during those monitoring events are very similar. We capture seal counts and we monitor uh, and record disturbances that occur during those activities. Disturbances to the harbor seal fall out. And then um, our, our monitoring plan and our permits also include minimization measures um, specifically that happened during the, the uh, pupping season. So um, from mid-March to end of June, if uh, there's a neonate on the beach, and a neonate is defined as any pup that's less than one week old, um, work, any beach management activities to minimize flood risk have to be delayed until the pups left or sort of the last possible day to prevent flooding. Um, and then unless flooding is imminent, beach management activities can't occur during the pupping season more than two consecutive days. And there needs to be a seven day no work period in between events. Um, and the reason why we have those specific measures is because it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally there'll be a beach management action where um, the river mouth will be opened and then it'll subsequently close like the next day because of you know big ocean wave conditions. Um, so it doesn't happen very often, but it can occur. So that's why we have these additional um, uh, provisions to minimize effects during the pupping season. Our Marine Mammal Protection Act permit for the project does report require us to report any um, suspected abandoned pups on the beach. So one thing that we ask monitors to do is to look for signs of abandonment during your survey. Um, so an abandoned pup, uh, some, some signs of that would be that um, you'll see a pup that hasn't had any contact with adults during your survey. Um, it hasn't moved at all, or um, it attempts, attempts to nurse um, and is rebuffed by um, the adult. Um, 
our permit does not allow us to um, handle any harbor seal or pup. So we ask that um, you know, no one try to attempt to approach or remove a pup from the beach. Instead, uh, please contact um, Andy or myself. Our contact information is, is on your data sheet so that we can report to NIMS' stranding network um, the uh, report of a potential abandoned pup. And then um, we report that immediately to NIMS' stranding network. And then we also make sure that we report to NIMS regional and headquarters offices within um, 48 hours, but it's usually at the same time we're uh, notifying the stranding network. So then what do we do with all the great data that everybody is collecting out there? Um, so the data sheets that the monitors fill out are reviewed and entered into um, our database. And then Andy will take all of that data and evaluate it for trends um, to help us answer some of those questions that are part of our goals and objectives of the monitoring plan. And she prepares an annual report presenting those results. Um, and we send that report to NIMS and state parks and stewards, and we post that up on our website um, as a public document. And with that, I will stop sharing and uh, take any questions about the, the estuary management project or the Pinniped monitoring plan. Um, thank you, Jessica. There are no questions in the chat but you're all free to unmute yourself and ask questions directly if you wish. Okay, I guess not. So thank you very much, Jessica. I'm, I'm sure that questions will come up. Um, oh, Karen has one here. Um, yeah, I have a question. There, there was some discussion last year, and I know there's discussion over at Seal Watch as well. Um, about what happens when we report, so if we're pinniped monitoring and we report a disturbance, you know, like we report that uh, people are crossing the barriers and disturbing the seals or kayaks are disturbing the seals. So we'll fill out a disturbance form and we're wondering what, like what happens with those? Is there ever any action? I mean, we're not enforcers, obviously, but, we're just curious what happens with those. Yeah, Andy, were you gonna describe some of that in your results reporting? Um, I mean, we I do mention kind of trends and disturbances, but um, I will say that, you know, all of that information from the baseline monitoring is included in our annual reports. And, um, and you know, we do any um, <clears throat> any stranding or you know injured animal gets reported right away, like Jessica mentioned. Um, the specific disturbances that um, a Sonoma water activity um, is also reported in detail. So, um, I mean, they do receive that on an annual basis. Um, in terms of like the question about what, you know, like, is there something that happens with that data? Well, for any Sonoma water activity, we have like a limited number of, of harassment action, like events that we, um, that we can instigate with our management activities or our monitoring activities. So in that sense, it's monitored, like we need to stay underneath that um, number each year and so we report that in detail um but as far as like beach users um you know it's just kind of summarized in the reports because we're not really um um like evaluating like specific incidents for for um kind of the shared use of the state beach, I guess is how I would describe it. So, um, and there's definitely, you know, kind of acknowledgement from state and federal agencies that there's a desire to maintain this kind of shared use um, of those public spaces. Does that help answer the question at all? Okay, thanks, Karen. Yeah, there's been a lot of concern on the part of um, both the pinniped monitors and then the seal watch 
um, volunteers who are out on the weekends. Um, but the frustration is that the um, ability to enforce is, is really limited. State Parks has no ability to enforce other than um, dogs that are on the beach because it is a beach where dogs are, are not allowed. Um, they are allowed on Blind Beach, which is south of Goat Rock Beach. And um, uh, Fish and Wildlife, who has authority over both the Green Mammal Protection Act and the fact that it's a, uh, an MPA, um, they have to actually witness an incident in order to do any enforcement, even if you were to take a video and report it to them, they cannot act on it. So um, there is some frustration among monitors um, of both programs on um, the ability to intercede or provide any kind of enforcement from an outside agency for disturbances. Are there yeah, any other uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mammal, and I was just gonna mention the, the estuary management projects, marine mammal permit doesn't speak to, um, I mean, we don't have any enforcement or regulatory um, sort of conditions in, um, uh, in that permit that applies to our program. Right. I think the best we can do is just collect the data so that um, an agency like um, California Fish and Wildlife at least knows that there is the potential for um, increased activity on their part there. Are there any other questions? Oh, Suki. Um, yes, so uh, my thought or my current take on this is with seal watching it, is is based on um, community education and interpretation helping to inform the public it's part of like community education whereas um, this program is more specific to monitoring the activities for when they need to breach and things of that nature and um, so being able to monitor before and up to the event of breaching the river mouth through the permit. Am yeah, I mm -hmm. yeah, the, it also during baseline surveys, um, disturbances are, are to the haul out itself are monitored. But you know, the baseline surveys are usually, well, I think almost exclusively happening during the week. Um, yeah. So and the highest visitors use is is, you know, on the weekends and holidays, when we are explicitly uh, not scheduling any beach management activities or baseline uh, monitoring. Okay, I, I like that because it, it gives you a little different perspective as well. And of course, if you're trying to breach during the week, it's not impacting, you're not so inundated with the general public down there. Right. Um, I heard somebody mention the kayakers and stuff. Just note that I do work with Seal Watch in putting ropes, um, I kind of, figure out the best spot to put the, the ends of the ropes and the seasonal red flags for the kayakers to see as a heads up of uh, staying back from that main wildlife feeding and breeding and birthing area at the river mouth which is also where the currents are uh, and so my goal in that is also you know hand in hand for public safety so um, if you didn't know what those flags <laughs> in the <laughs> at the end of the ropes were about. Um, that's that's what that's for. Suki, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to say thank you very much for doing that. I worked on Seal Watch for many years and it really makes a difference. And then I'm doing pinniped monitor, you can see from above, it really does channel people away. So uh, thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, uh, put them in the chat as we go. If you have something, and and Andy, if you don't mind my interrupting uh, with questions as they appear. Yeah, um, that works for me. Um, are you guys seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, whoops, I put the wrong one up. Hang on just a second. Uh, I'm going to start with a slideshow that is um, focusing on uh, IDing the pinnipeds that you will uh, encounter at uh, the haul out. And then I'll go over um, 
kind of summary of results from our monitoring and um, also uh, uh, description of what happens during a baseline survey and kind of a, a introduction to what it is to do a survey. So, okay, so you should see one screen with a picture of the beach. And it's visible. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so there are um, a few different uh, species that you might encounter um, when you're doing surveys of Goat Rock State Beach. Um, there are actually six species of pinnipeds that we could encounter along our coastline. Two of them are um, from the phocid seal family or the true seals, and um, four of them are from the eared seals or the odoriid family. So I'm going to start with our star of our show, the harbor seal. So harbor seals are found um, widely distributed in the northern hemisphere along the coast. Um, they occupy a number of habitats. Um, they can be, um, uh, they're non-migratory. So while you might get some dispersal from like the, the haul out where an individual is born, um, they don't make seasonal migrations. Uh, they can be two different color types. They can be uh, dark with light spots and light with dark spots. Um, it's best to kind of see this later in the summer after they've molted and they have a new coat of fur. Um, when you get into like winter time in the spring before the molt, they all look kind of brown and a little bit like the color of the sand. Um, yeah, it's the population now is um, estimated to be about 30,000 just for the state of California, including uh, the Channel Islands down south. The other type of um, true seal that we could encounter here is the northern elephant seal, um, very different from the harbor seal. They are um, distributed from uh, Baja to Alaska. They undergo uh, large migrations twice a year. They spend a lot of time out at sea and a lot less time on shore. They come ashore mainly during the winter, during their breeding season, and during their molt in the spring. They're actually in the middle of their breeding season now, so um, Point Reyes is a good place nearby to see elephant seals um, uh, in, their, in their harems and with their pups this time of year. Uh, males and females are very different in size. Males are um, most easily identified by, by their large proboscis, and um, they're just giant, like two tons, <laughs> and deceptively fast for their size. Uh, so don't get close. Don't put your kid on top of it to take a photo. It's a bad idea. Um, females are smaller and um, generally uh, they have short uh, flippers. They're kind of brown in color. Um, one thing that really helps distinguish them from a harbor seal, if we were to see them on the beach, is some of their behavior. So elephant seals will do this um, behavior, flipping sand onto their back, and a uh, harbor seal won't do that. So there have been cases where we have young elephant seals hauled out on the beach near the harbor seals. And at first glance, it just kind of looks like a larger and less attractive harbor seal, in my opinion. Um, they have big eyes and black whiskers. That's another identifying characteristic. Um, but the sand flipping is kind of a kind of a giveaway for them. Uh, and we do encounter them occasionally. And I, in the 12 years that I've been out, I've only seen sub-adults um, on the beach and no adult. I know in the past there have been some stray adult males that have occupied the beach for a period of time. So now moving on to our eared seals, um, starting with California sea lion. We, they can be at the Jenner area um, year round, but they're typically found during their migratory periods. They'll move down from uh, Northern waters in Alaska down to their breeding areas as far South as Baja in the summertime. 
Uh, males are the migratory ones. Uh, females tend to stay near their breeding beaches year round. So we'll get groups of large males. Um, they don't often come ashore, but you will hear them. Those are the animals that you hear barking um, and the ones that hang out at the piers in San Francisco. Um, so they make kind of a ruckus when they're around at Goat Rock. Um, they are, uh, their body type is different. They have longer flippers and they're able to, to rotate their hind flippers so they can have an upright posture. A harbor seal or an elephant seal cannot do that. So um, if you see kind of an upright uh, pinniped on the beach, it's likely going to be a California sea lion. Um, males and females are, are different size-wise, so sexually dimorphic. An adult male will have a big um, prominent forehead that can sometimes get like bleached with the sun, a little top knot. Um, and their faces are much more dog-like, kind of like a Labrador retriever where they have a distinct muzzle. And uh, population is just over about 250,000 individuals for, um, for this California to Alaska group. Here's some photographs that kind of help kind of put them in context um, compared to harbor seals. So these are all taken um, here at the Russian River. So uh, the photograph on the left shows kind of a sub-adult um, individual, probably a male, right there with the harbor seals, you know, kind of the upright posture, the long flippers, um, and the ears that you can see helps identify them. The upper right photograph is a group of younger individuals. Those can be a little harder to distinguish um, because they're not going to have a big top knot. Um, so there was a there have been periods of times where we get uh, where young individuals kind of stray from their um, natal areas and we find them up here. Like I said, oftentimes you see them in the water. So here's a group of males that are coming in. Um, likely to have a snack on their migratory route um, before heading back down. Um, actually, this was in December, so maybe going back up north. Um, as I mentioned, you often see them only in the water. You don't need to make a count of them in the water, but it is nice to have a recording when they're in the area. So you can make comments on your data sheet if you see um, sea lions in the water. They tend to be more obvious when they're swimming. Um, you can often see a wake behind them. They'll swim with their head fully out of the water. Um, and they do more um, propelling with their forelimbs, unlike a harbor seal. So you'll often see like a limb um, sticking out of the water. Uh, I think they're actually like foraging on fish right here. So you see activity with the birds and everything around. Um, as opposed to a harbor seal, which is going to be um, a lot more stealthy in the water. Rarely are they making a wake and they tend to just kind of um, bob up out of the water and look around and then swim, swim underwater. So those are the most common species that we'll see. I'm going to go over some identifying characteristics for some other species that could occur that we do need to have um, uh, record of because we'll need to uh, one of the species I go to is actually listed under the Endangered Species Act so we need to notify um, the resource agencies right away if we see them. So there are stellar sea lions um, in small numbers in in the area. I think there's a um, occasionally some up near Fort uh, Fort Bragg and um, oh I'm forgetting the other. Anyway, it's so, um, further up north. They are very similar to a California sea lion. They are larger. Their, um, their muzzle is more blunt, so they have more of a bear-shaped face than a dog-shaped face. Um, the females are larger also They have than a California sea lion female. They have kind of a barrel chest. Um, I've not seen one at Goat Rock State Beach. I don't think we have any recording of any out there. Um, they're smaller population um, than California sea lions for sure. So um, I would say if you think something could be a stellar sea lion, make sure to take a picture um, and we can 
we can try to suss that out. There are two species of fur seals that could be encountered. Um, the observations of fur seals along our coast tend to come from stranding records where young or injured individuals or undernourished individuals will come ashore. Both species are more pelagic in their habitat. So they spend more time out at sea in deep water, typically only coming ashore during their breeding period. And, um, but occasionally they will make brief kind of resting stops along um, kind of unpopulated areas along the coast. So it's pretty rare, but we have had some recordings of them in recent years in Sonoma County along the coast. Um, they are smaller than sea lions, but they have very, very long, prominent, kind of goofy looking flippers. Um, they're not really designed to move around on land. So um, they, uh, and they'll often wave their flippers for thermoregulation. So um, as a way to cool off, they have really thick, dark fur, um, hence their name. And their faces are much smaller and pointier, um, not really dog or bear like at all. Um, so they should be pretty obviously different from any other um, individual that you would see out there, but definitely take pictures and note their location. Um, if you see anything looks like a fur seal. The other species is even more rare, the Guadalupe fur seal. They occur primarily in waters off the Mexican um, coast. Um, they can be confused with a California sea lion. Their fur isn't quite as dark as the northern fur seal. They also have a small face, but they're not quite as pointy as um, a northern fur seal. They do have dark um, darker fur and really long, prominent flippers. Um, one thing I do want to point out, the difference between them is um, kind of if you look at the fur on their fore flipper, a Guadalupe fur seal has a um, has the fur extending down past their wrist onto the top of their fore flipper. Whereas a northern fur seal has like a straight line where the fur ends and doesn't extend down past the wrist. Um, it's they're both would be very rare sightings. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about trying to distinguish the species, but definitely you want to get as good of pictures as you can. Um, if we have an opportunity um, to be out on the overlook together, I can show you how you can use the spotting scope to take a close up picture too, which can be really helpful. So those are the those are the species that we could encounter. And like I said, um, when in doubt, take a photo and let me know. Email it to me, um, or upload it to the the drive, the Google Drive, and let me know that it's there. Um, I do want to point out here. Here's some photos that I took through the spotting scope when we've had different species out there. Um, I'm sorry, it might be a little hard to see depending on the size of your screen. The um, Let's see if I can zoom in. Ooh, okay. Okay, so this is um, a California sea lion, actually. It's not in its characteristic upright posture. Um, you can't really see its flippers at all. You can't see its face. So it looks kind of like a log. Um, but uh, this one wasn't doing too well. It's a, a subadult male. Um, it's pretty skinny. You can see its, its hip bones and its shoulder blades pretty prominently. Um, so this one was actually, um, you know, we reported it as, a, as a, a stranded animal and sent that information along to the, to the resource agencies. Um, so sometimes, you know, it can be difficult, but it's definitely a live animal not in with the harbor seal haul out. So that's something you want to take a closer look at. Let's see if I can figure out how to unzoom my screen. There we go. Okay. Now this guy, whoops. Hang on. Zooming again. Here we go. Okay. 
So here's another tricky one. Up here in the upper right, we actually have not a harbor seal. It took me a while to figure it out that it wasn't a harbor seal, but like I mentioned before, the sand flipping was what oriented me to that individual. So difference in color and size, really not that pronounced. Um, if you take, you know, in person, you could get a close look at the face and notice that the whiskers were much darker and the eyes were really big and dark. Um, but that's a young elephant seal um, hanging out. They And I've seen them like right in the middle of the harbor seal haul out before too. So um, you might not notice them right away, but you're out there for a few hours and it's usually their behavior that tends to, to tip you off that it's not... Um, that one of those is not like the other. Okay, uh, let's see. Any questions about any of those species? There's nothing in the chat, Andy. Okay, so Jessica did talk about pups. Um, I'm just gonna do a little bit more on identifying um, pups. We're gonna start seeing them soon. Um, we have seen pups as early as February, but they tend to be uh, premature at this point in the season and premature pups often don't survive. Um, their lungs aren't developed enough usually for them um, to make it if they're born at this point. Um, so we do start seeing uh, viable births in March. And once a pup is born, it'll stay with its um, with its mom for about a month where it nurses on some really uh, high quality, high fat milk. Um, they are not obligated to stay with their mom the whole time during this period. Uh, the moms will start to forage at a certain point. Uh, harbor seal pups can swim right away, which makes it um, difficult to count them because they're not <laughs> they're not restricted to staying ashore. Um, so they can be swimming with their mom. Here's a nice picture of one on the back of the mom. Um, and sometimes they're left alone. Um, but within the four hour period of your survey, you should see an individual pup be with its mom. Um, if you were to be out there and you saw a pup alone kind of wandering around, that's what you would want to report as a potential abandoned pup to us that, um, like Jessica mentioned earlier. Um, we do need to distinguish between neonate pups and pups older than a week old um, in our surveys. So it's... Uh, Good to get some practice out during the pupping season and aging them. A neonate is less than a week old. You see one here on the left-hand side. It still has its umbilicus attached. Uh, you can kind of see the hip bones. There's wrinkles um, in the kind of waist hip area. Their movements are not very fluid. They're kind of jerky and um, like they don't have much muscle tone at that point. So they're kind of weak. Uh, after they've been nursing for a week or so, they start to really round out. They have that characteristic football shape, no more hip bones um, that you can see, no more wrinkles that you can see, no more umbilicus, and their movements are much stronger and much more fluid. Um, once they're weaned, you know, then we won't see them associated with a female anymore. They're kind of on their own at that point. Um, so to identify something as a pup with certainty, you do want to see that association with a female, that kind of pup-like behavior. You don't necessarily always see them nursing, but you will see them kind of oriented in this perpendicular way. Um, uh, so that's a good sign that you're looking at a pup there. They can be pretty tricky to distinguish from an animal that's about a year old, because during that first year when they're foraging on their own and they don't have their mom helping them anymore, um, they don't grow a lot. So they'll be really, really big and round and fat when they're weaned, and then they kind of start to lose weight and then level off so that a year old pup and a, and a weaned pup can be about the same size. Um, one thing that does help is that a, a pup from the current year will have uh, a very new shiny coat and a year old um, individual won't have molted yet. And so the coat won't be quite so shiny. 
So I do have some pictures here. Um, we can take our little quiz. If you guys want to take your hand identifying um, which one of these photographs shows a neonate pup. So a pup less than a week old. You can just shout out an answer if you want. A. A, yep. That's a neonate there. What tipped you off? The uh, the skin, the folds on the skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fuzzy, really wrinkly, really tiny. Mm -hmm. Any other ones that could be a neonate out in these photographs in addition to A? D looks like one neonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good job. D for sure. So you can see some wrinkles. And one of the other tip offs is the mom next to it has a little blood on her rump still. So that pup has been born very recently. The mom hasn't even gone for a swim yet. Um, yeah, so that leaves us with B and C. B, we can see this one. Um, that pup is getting close to weaning, I would say. It's like uh, approaching mom size. Sometimes, you know, you start to, you just can see the mom shrinking and the pups getting bigger <laughs> as the weeks go on. Um, but we do have that perpendicular orientation. So even though the pup's not actively nursing, um, that's a good indication that when you're looking at a pup there, even though it's pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, and then for C, I would say we can't, we can't see its lower part of the body. You can't see if it's wrinkly. We can't see if it has an umbilicus. We know it's a pup, it's nursing. In that case, if you have no evidence that it is a neonate, then you would record it as a pup. So if you can't tell if it, because you can't see or you're uncertain whether or not it's less than a week old, then you should record it as a, as a pup. Okay, great job, everyone. Any questions on ID before I start to talk about um, our other stuff? There are no other questions in the chat, Andy. Great. Okay. Can you still see my screen? Yep. Okay. Uh, there we go. Get this out of the way here. Okay. So like I said, I'm going to start with a summary of trends that we've um, observed over the years and then more detail about uh, what it is to do a survey. So um, feel free to raise your hand or just go off mute and ask questions if they come up, especially when we get to um, how to do a survey. So there are questions for people that are returning that you've been wanting to um, have me answer. Now is a good time. Not sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, here we go. Um, so these are um this is actually data from from one year, I think it's 2021, that shows the average number of harbor seals counted during baseline surveys by month. Um, and the little bars on the top of are the error bars there. Uh, and this is pretty representative of what we see in most years where we have um, an increase during the summer months, which would coincide with the, the pupping season and the molting season, followed by um, a pretty notice uh, sharp decline in the fall, which uh, is likely attributed to seals spending less time on land. So if you've been kind of spending a lot of time raising a pup or um, holding an, a territory for mating, if you're a male, um, and that period is over, you might, you're going to be hungry and spend less time resting and more time out at sea. Um, so that's, it's pretty common to what they see um, in other places where harbor seals are found. Um, and like I said, so this shows kind of a line graph of the same thing, but for 10 years. So you can see the pattern holds true in most years, 
um, with some exceptions where we've um, observed more individuals ashore during the winter um, and a little bit less in the summertime. They, we have um, been able to establish uh, a connection between certain um, environmental factors or uh, and the abundance of seals on the haul out. And one of them is time of day. Uh, so this is a scatter plot. So each point is a count of harbor seals. And then the red line is um, like a linear regression uh, looking at any trends in that data set. And these are broken up by season. So we do, when we do see a relationship between time of day and the number of seals on the beach, um, more seals are present on the beach later in the day. So there are fewer seals early in the morning and the haul out builds as the day goes on. Uh, keep in mind, we only are making these recordings during the day. So we don't actually have information on abundance at night. Um, so during daylight hours, uh, these are the patterns that we see. You do not see a relationship during the fall and during the summer. And if you remember from the earlier graph, the summertime had a lot of seals and the fall had very few seals. So I think what we're seeing here is that in the period of time where seals are not really abundant on the beach, there's not a, there's not a daytime pattern to when they come ashore to rest. And when they're spending a lot of time on the beach because it's pupping time or breeding time, um, then they're gonna, um, there's not like a pattern to when they arrive. They're just there, they're either there or not there, but when they do come and go, they tend to be there more later in the day. Um, we also see an influence um, on tide height where during, um, very high tides, you'll get fewer seals on the beach, but in this middle ground, it's pretty even. So high tides are often associated with wave overwash of the haul out too. So they'll haul out as long as there's the space for them to haul out. And when the water starts pushing them off, then, um, then we don't find them so much. So no big surprise there. We also see um, an influence on whether or not the river mouth is open or closed. The harbor seals tend to be more abundant on the haul out when the river mouth is open. Um, there's also some kind of influence of season wrapped up into this because we do typically see more beach closure events where the river mouth is closed um, in the fall which also coincides with the time of year when seals are less abundant on shore. So, um, but even outside of that, seals do tend to um, be more abundant when the river mouth is open. Um, and that's likely due with their preference of getting to the estuary side of the beach where they like to haul out by swimming there through the mouth channel, as opposed to um, kind of scooting along the beach from where the ocean waves are breaking to the estuary side. We do see them haul out on the ocean side, but a lot less frequently. They definitely favor the, the estuary side of the barrier beach. Um, we have been recording disturbances during baseline surveys um, since we've started this monitoring program. So these would be, um, you know, anything that's causing a seal on the haul out to, to alert or orient to um, a noise or the presence of something um, or move kind of from where they are to a new spot on the beach or leave the beach entirely. Those are the types of disturbances that we observe. And so this is kind of any disturbance that fits that category is what's recorded here. The gray bars are the average number of seals um, for that particular day. And the dots are the number of seals that were disturbed, um, the total number by source. So that's why you'll see a dot higher than a gray bar because um, seals can be disturbed more than once, the same individuals, and we're averaging kind of the number of seals on the beach rather than the maximum. So most of the dots are red. Most of the disturbance is um, 
are from people. Um, and we do have other sources that could include um, things like uh, um, vehicle noise, um, birds, uh, other um, kind of, sometimes it's debris floating past them. It could be an aircraft. Uh, so those are something in the other category. But like I said, um, people are the most common source of disturbance. So in our baseline surveys, 62% of those surveys have the seals being um, disturbed by people on the beach. And 36% of those surveys have seals being disturbed by people in kayaks. Hey, we Andy, also, can I ask a question? Yeah. This is Melanie on your other chart. Is it fair to say that the number of disturbances has um, gone down in recent years based on this chart? Um, or not? I don't know if I would make that assessment from this just because um, it's probably not organized in a way to make that correlation. Um, I haven't noticed it change over time very often. Um, there is some evidence in our monitoring data that seals um, might be becoming habituated to certain activities on the beach. So in, in that case, we might be observing a lower frequency of um, disturbance responses. Um, and what the data that leads me to that conclusion is that when you look at the distance at which seals start to be disturbed, um, we have seen a decrease in that distance over time. Yeah. So people have to get a little bit closer. <laughs> you know, kayaks have to get a little bit closer because the seals kind of, especially older individuals, um, they'll have, you know, they've probably been coming to, you know, Goat Rock State Beach for many years they have learned, you know, when things are not, a, not a threat, I, um, mm -hmm. is my supposition there. So, um, but we have seen that like a, a decrease in the distance to the time at first disturbance. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you compare it to other places, like, um, where they do monitoring and point rays, we do see, um, like our kind of rate of disturbance is, is a little bit higher than places where it's harder for people to get to. So thinking of a place like Bolinas Lagoon where you know people can't like walk up to it, it's more isolated. So, um, you know, it's, it's something that happens, um, you know, kind of typically for them. And um, it does, there is some evidence that they might be getting, getting used to these, um, disturbances. Plus, I think people are also pretty aware. So if you're trying to get a picture of the seal, you're going to like approach really slowly and take your time and, and they are less disturbed by those activities than like a kid, you know, chasing <laughs> a ball and like running into the hollow. That's a very different activity for, from their perspective, for sure. I, thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> okay. Okay, we also um, are uh, recording disturbances specific to Sonoma water activities on the beach, um, especially the, um, the mechanical breaching of the beach. And we see that, you know, you would expect like 100% of those surveys to cause a disturbance. Um, and the reason why it ends up being 84% is there's not always seals on the beach when we start an activity. And sometimes the seals are far enough away in their haul out that if we don't get close to the haul out, um, they aren't actually disturbed by that activity. We do see um, a pattern um, in monitoring these activities where there are fewer seals on the, the pre-activity surveys and um, as opposed to the post activity. So any of these pre-breaching or pre-lagoon outlet surveys would be in a closed mouth condition. 
Um, and then after it's been, either the outlet channel has been created or it's been breached, um, it's now an open river mouth condition and there are more seals. So um, that is a pattern that we see consistently also. So we are monitoring um, pups on the on the beach and trying to get an assessment of the the size the the population size of pups each year as best we can. Um, it is really difficult to count all of the pups because um, because they can swim right away. Um, and we've seen you know um, pretty consistent numbers. Um, so even though it looks like in the last few years the overall. Um, abundance of seals on the haulout has been slightly decreasing. The number of pups has been pretty consistent. Um, this chart doesn't include this, the 2022 season um, year, but we did. So this is um, the bar represents like the maximum, the daily maximum count of pups. And then the little diamond in the middle is kind of the average for the season. So for 2022, um, it would be 42. This is kind of my, my preliminary. I haven't done my report yet, but um, about 42 for the maximum number of pups born last season and an average of 15. So very similar to what we've seen in the last couple of years. Okay, I'm going to get started with kind of an overview of how to do a survey. So if you have any questions about what I talked about before, um, chime in, otherwise I'll get going. And I will say that like, I'm gonna go over some of this stuff, but um, I will be doing an in-person in the field training, um, one in March and one in April. So it, this is all like, a bit much right now, don't worry. You'll get a chance to like go over it and see what it looks like um, in person. Okay, so this is a data sheet. Um, this is what you're gonna use to record observations during um, any of the surveys, whether it's baseline or like a pre-breaching survey. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do, um, you probably wanna get to the general visitor center to pick up your gear, you know, before you need to be out at the overlook. I like to get my equipment set up and then do, you know, like record kind of what I'm doing, the, the who, what, when, um, and then, um, and then, uh, after I've done that, I like to just get out the binoculars at first and, and look around, um, see where the seals are hauled out and look for any other species, anything unusual, um, kind of orient myself before I start counting seals. Yeah, again, looking for things other than harbor seals, um, right? So look, you might see a group of harbor seals right near the mouth. You want to make sure you're kind of looking throughout the beach, seeing that you're not missing anything, seeing if there's any stranded animals out there. Um, I like to draw a map just on the back side of the data sheet. You guys might even have a separate data sheet for drawing a map. This is really helpful when you need to describe something that happens later on. Like if there's a disturbance or if you're not quite sure what something is or, um, uh, and just for my own record keeping, it kind of makes sense to like record where the individual groups are, where, um, especially as we get into pupping season, the seals are gonna spread out and there's gonna be a lot more groups of small, smaller groups of seals spread out along the beach. So it doesn't need to be, um, you know, artistic, but usually I include things like haystack rock, a big rock with kind of the uh, yellow colored plants on it, um, the jetty, the river mouth, those kind of things help orient us. What are you talking about? Okay, so then you have, we do record some environmental conditions like air temperature, um, wind speed, wind direction, um, and all those details are um, kind of in your in your notes for how to fill this out. We can go over it in person. So you're going to record um, seals every 30 minutes. So start with what time it is when you start your count. You record groups um, individually. So 
uh, depending on how many groups there are. So in this photograph, in this drawing, there was A, B, C, D, and E. So each of those groups would get their own kind of line on the data sheet. Um, we record harbor seals by age. We can't really tell if they're like an adult or a sub-adult. So we have like pups and not pups. So anything that's not a pup goes into the non-pup count column. Then we have our two categories of pups. So neonates, pups under one week, and then any pup older than that would be counted in those categories. And we're really only doing that March to June. After the end of June, we really can't tell whether or not um, a pup from that year, uh, you can't tell the difference between this year's pup and last year's, you know, pup. So we just don't try to do that because um, then you're just kind of making guesses based on size. So we get our pup counts just during these months. If we see something that's not a harbor seal, then we would write down the species. If you think it's a juvenile or an adult or a pup, you go there and then the number. We only need to record these on the in this box if they're on land. If you see them in the water, you can make a comment. And then we would kind of add up all the seals on this line and put the total there. And that's just for one beach site. And we do want to keep track of the number of people that are on the beach. Um, if they're like way out toward the parking lot or like at Penny Island, we don't need to record that. So um, I have a little note like near the beach site. So kind of if the harbor seals can see them, then you can count them. And those are people, um, they could be people in the water or people on land. And you can write a comment kind of describing where the people are. So we talked about these already, just another couple photographs for um, identifying pups versus neonates. You want to take pictures every day. Um, you can just do it at the beginning of your survey, just kind of when you're doing your drawing your map, take a photograph of the haul out. Um, those are really helpful for um, kind of clarifying um, any questions we might have in the data recording. Um, yeah, and it also, you know, you can take photographs of anything else that you think is noteworthy. If you're making a report of an injured or potentially stranded animal, that would be good. If you have any questions on species ID, take a photograph. If you see any individual with specific marking, we do sometimes see animals that have been released from the Marine Mammal Center that are like post, post rehab animals that might have a flipper tag. You could record the color of the tag. Sometimes they even have um, little like numbers glued on their head. Um, so you might see something with like a little hat on it. So you'd wanna record that and take a picture if possible. Um, we do record disturbances during the surveys. Um, and so, so we do the counts every 30 minutes, kind of within all of the time that you're out there, you would record disturbances as they occur. Um, and this is going to be a tally. And the tally is just going to be the number of times um, the species, you know, so in this case, harbor seals and then by life, um, by age group, so adults or non pups. Um, so each kind of category would get its own disturbance sheet. So if you had pups versus adults, you would um, have a different data sheet for your pup disturbances. Um, or you could just indicate that pups were also there and disturbed on the data sheet. Um, so we have the source of the disturbance on the left column and across the top, the response. And so you would just tally as you see these things occurring. Um, so an alert would be an individual that, uh, or a number of individuals that kind of looked up and oriented toward the disturbance source, um, moving would be any kind of movement away from the disturbance source on the beach and a flush is when they leave the beach and go into the water. Um, so you're just tallying these as they occur. 
So in this example, we have a photographer on the beach. The SEAL's first response was to alert. And then the photographer got closer and the SEALs left the beach and flushed into the water. And so you would record both of these responses for the same source. Um, and maybe an hour later, like a different person comes up on the beach and, you know, you would just add a tally if there was a, a response to that same source. So, and then, you know, maybe kayakers came by. So you get the idea. We're just um, recording um, you know, giving a tick mark for every kind of type of response based on disturbance source. And you can just keep kind of adding, you know, in your comments as different sort, you know, if you want to describe in more detail, you can use the back of the sheet to like, tell me more about it too, if you want, if you weren't sure how to record something, um, and I can help kind of figure that out. Um, okay, the other important bit is making sure we have these um, injury and mortality report forms that are completed. So uh, we work with um, the, um, the stranding network and the resource agencies and actually um, Cal Academy of Sciences who would want um, like fresh carcasses for um, from research that they do. Um, so we kind of keep this data sheet. Um, it's very similar to what they would use um, in making these observations. And it has um, specific information about the exact location. Uh, you can, you know, take a picture or point to it on your on your sketch. And then we can use, um, you know, Google Earth or something back at the office to like get the actual coordinates um, for that, but they like that. Um, so just do your best to put in the information. They do um, prefer if you can include a, a video or a photograph, um, that really helps them. Um, so you're just kind of doing your best to provide the details there. Um, so injuries would include um, anything from uh, like potential bite wounds, like from a shark, or um, it could, they're especially interested in any kind of human related activities. So anything that could look like a propeller wound or entanglement in fishing line, or those are things that we see um, occasionally. You can see this photograph, this one has kind of a bite out of it there. So that was something that was reported as an injury, even though the animal wasn't stranded. Um, we do report that because they like to keep track of um, different sources of injury to animals. Um, I included this photograph at the bottom of a, of a seal that has like kind of like a scratch near its ear hole, especially during the breeding season, you might see like facial scratches and like surface wounds. We don't need to report those as, as an injury or a stranding unless there's something about that individual that looks like it's you know, in, in poor shape, um, you know, or like where they're, um, sometimes they're like fingernails, you know, get kind of damaged, that kind of thing. Um, when in doubt, you can always fill it out. It doesn't, you know, there's no harm in that, but, um, we're not really talking about like kind of superficial scratches, but something, um, a little bit more severe. Any questions about injury or stranding reporting? Another example that we see is like undernourished. So like really skinny looking individuals, particularly with species that aren't harbor seals um, that come ashore, they're often kind of undernourished. Hey, Andy, I just had a couple of general questions yeah. um, as now that we've been out there. Yeah. <laughs> so coming back. Um, so you mentioned before how, if we're not sure if it's a neonate or a pup to not call it a neonate, to call it a pup, should we do the same thing with, if we're not sure if it's a pup or adult noted as an adult? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. We'll and since it. you're counting every 30 minutes, like that number can totally change. You could have oh, yeah. counted one as a as an adult at one point and then see it nursing later on and then it's going to get counted as a pup later on so you know just do your best for that one kind of 30 minute count and then realizing that kind of as you're able to make more observations of their behavior you might 
make a different call later on. And that's why we, we look at kind of like the maximum number recorded in a day. Um, that is so helpful. Thank you. Cause we've had that question. We're like, Oh no, do we go back and change it? Cause <laughs> yeah, that's, so you can treat those as like an individual census. So it's like okay. at that point in time, this is what I saw. This is how I called it. And then that can change in the next 30 minutes. That's totally fine. So then the same thing kind of like, gosh, it's, it's not as hard when there's like maybe like 20 to 40 or 50 of them out there, you know, yeah. but when you've got like hundreds, it's yeah. really, really hard to keep yeah. track of your count. Like I, I tried like, you know, going horizontally and then back horizontally and then going vertical. And, and then I'm like, oh my God, where am I? I can't even tell where I'm at on the beach. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so how accurate do we need to be like within like 10 to 20 or like, can you give some guidance? Cause how, how much do we need to try and kill ourselves to get it accurate is what I need, need some guidance on. Yeah. I would say, um, you know, you're going to get a chance again to make another count. So, um, and I'm looking for like, I use both averages and maximum counts. So they don't need to be close to each other, like the individual counts. Um, okay. You know, I, when there's time, I try to like count the group a couple times and make sure that I'm within five seals, you know, of my own number. We do that too. We're like, well, Ava will take a count and then I'll take yeah. a count and then we kind of cross check against each other. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So I would say within five seals, again, depending on the size of the group, if the group is 500 and you're within 10 or 20, that's pretty good. If the group that's, is really yeah. small, then yeah. I would say you'd want to be within a couple of seals. Yeah. Um, we try to keep it when it's small, like within one, yeah. two, like if we're getting much farther off from that, we'll recount again. <laughs> yeah. And I use, hopefully you have a clicker. I'll we use do. a clicker when groups get really big. So I can super just helpful. like, and I also count in groups of five when there's a lot of seals. So I just kind of visualize, okay, five, 10, 15, 20, 20. Oh, 30. okay. That's another really good, good way to do it. Okay. And then you said too, you kind of implied, and I just wanted to make sure you said, cause we've been assuming all along, we're not counting those in the water that applies to all seals, all, right. all of them. Right. Okay. That's yeah. what I thought. Cause that's what we've been doing is just noting in the notes when we see yeah. them. In the water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Harbor seals in the water, unless they're doing something really crazy, you don't really need to make a note of. So it's definitely other species that are in the water. Please make a comment somewhere on the data sheet, but they only really get counted if they're on land. Okay. That is so helpful. Thank you very much. Appreciate sure. Andy, one real quick question. How many um, uh, monitors are out there at one given time uh, at the lookouts? We usually just schedule one, except some people do prefer to work as a team, and that's fine. Um, but I will, you know, like Hollis mentioned at the beginning, I will give her dates, and then she'll post the schedule. People can sign up. So if there's someone else already signed up and you're new to it, you can try to reach out to them and see if they, you know, if they don't mind having someone mm -hmm. out there, I would leave it up to kind of the individuals, um, whether or not you want to work, but it's really just a one, we, we have it set aside for one person to do. And I think it has, you know, I'll let, um, Hollis or some of the stewards speak to like, I know there's like reimbursement and stipend and stuff like that. So how that, works out if you have more than one person i don't know um so it's always from the same lookout area yeah you do yeah the big observations pull out mm -hmm, is okay really the best spot so we don't have people down on the beach which is different from seal watch where they have people you know on the beach doing their monitoring we're always up at the overlook at the overlook okay yeah Great. So Jessica already um, talked about kind of the schedule. So, you know, surveys are four hours long. They can occur anywhere from eight to 4 p.m. Um, you know, if you started later in the afternoon and it was in the summertime, you could, you could be out there longer than four if you wanted, but it's kind of generally um, the hours that we're gonna encompass. We only schedule them Monday through Friday, um, and we split the surveys between Sonoma Water staff and stewards staff. Um, Sonoma Water doesn't typically have field staff working on Fridays, so we would be doing like Monday through Thursday, but totally fine if stewards wants to do it on uh, Friday. 
Um, I will give dates to Hollis, like I said, but if you are interested in doing it a certain week, but like I have Tuesday and you can only do Wednesday, totally fine to sign up and say, I'm going to do it on Wednesday. Just make sure you record that you've switched it. Um, we prefer you not doing it on the weekend just to be consistent with our monitoring that we've done so far. Um, but if, you know, there's a suggested day on the schedule and you want to kind of change it by a day or two on either side, that would work. And you can pick your start time. Um, also, it's just, you know, plan on being there for four hours. And like she said, also um, during the pupping season, we're actually going to do them weekly. So there'll be a lot more opportunities during April and May when we're doing them once a week. But same thing, four hours long, you know, during the daytime. And then as needed, we would do pre and post activity monitoring that we Hollis would kind of reach out to volunteers for. And again, four hours during the daytime. Um, and I did mention that I will be doing some in-person field training. So this is good for new people, returning people. Uh, you don't have to stay the whole time. It's kind of like an open house situation. I'll be out there. Hopefully I'll have at least one other staff from Sonoma Water with me. Um, and we'll have our own gear, you know? So if you're coming from the stewards, um, you know, someone should pick up the gear from the um, volunteer center and uh, so that we can be looking through scopes kind of at the same time, talking about what we see. Hopefully there'll be pups out there, different age classes, so we can talk about ID um, issues at that time too. Um, yeah. And I will make sure, um, you know, that my contact information is kind of on the schedule thing. We'll include these dates on the schedule that Hollis will post so people can sign up. So I have some idea of how many people might be out there um, in case, you know, I want to bring kind of an extra helper along just to help with that. Can we have some veterans that are very comfortable mentoring uh, newcomers and others that isn't that are not as comfortable. And so um, we can have you shadow uh, Clara or Sherry or um, someone who's really experienced and um, you know, really comfortable with mentoring a new volunteer so that you're not out there by yourself for the very first time. Yeah, I would say if you're new, you need to either come out on one of those two dates with me and, you know, plan on being there for a few hours to have a training um, and or go with a experienced stewards mentor before kind of signing up to do a shift on your own. So that's all I have. That was really great, Andy. I've been taking notes. I learned so much more with each one of these. It's amazing how much I've lost in the period of a year. <laughs> so um, where do we go from here? Um, Andy mentioned um, the possibility of a stipend and we have two ways that you can participate in the program. Um, we are under contract with Sonoma Water. And so you can um, volunteer as a stewards of the Coast and Redwoods volunteer where um, you report your hours and your shifts on a um, stipend request form. And I'll be sending um, examples of those out to you in a follow-up email. Or you can volunteer as a state parks volunteer um, where you record your hours on the Better Impact database. And those hours count towards a um, state parks pass for next year. Um, if you volunteer a total of 16 hours, then you get a district-wide pass, which, by the way, includes all of the um, uh, state park beaches along the Mendocino Coast, most of which are paid per use. So that's really nice. And if you volunteer a total of 200 hours, then you get a statewide pass. So those are your two options. I'll be sending out an email following up with you, um, making sure that you're interested in volunteering with the program and um, what your status, your preferred status is, and I can give you the forms that are necessary for each of those. 
So are there any more questions of either Jessica or Andy or myself? It's nice to see so many of you here today. Suki, did you raise your hand? So not uh, as much as a question, but just a comment out there to everybody, because this looks like our, our volunteer group. <laughs> um, I have volunteered in a lot of different aspects with stewards since 1987. I haven't done this particular one. Um, so, but I'm sure, you know, in shadowing with somebody else, I'll be right up on the paperwork and I'm used to all kinds of different paperwork. And then once that once that's done, I'm more than happy at any time for someone to partner up with someone um, at the river mouth. You know, I, I enjoy company and it's good to have two different perspectives on trying mm -hmm. to figure out if some things neonatal or not. <laughs> Thank you, Suki. And that would be a real treat because um, if there's anybody with deep knowledge of what's going on at the estuary, and of uh, the mouth of the river, it's Suki Waters. She's been connected with that part of the environment for a long, long time. As have your mother and grandmother. I just uh, wanna say thank you all. That was a really, really helpful training after being out there. So thank you for clarifying. Um, it really helps us get better and uh, uh, we really enjoy it. And so thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the training. And thank you for your questions, Melanie, because you beat me to the punch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On a couple of them, I was better. <laughs> so it was really helpful to me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Is there anything else? Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. And um, I'll be getting out a follow-up email to you today or at the very latest tomorrow. I'm having some power issues down here. So it depends on when I can get one out. And thank you so much for your interest in this particular program and in all the programs and um, for your support of Stewards of the Coast and Redwood. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you, all. Alice. Great to see you all today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um,